The Casio CZ1 is a mighty synthesizer, but unfortunately the LCD screen used an electroluminescent backlight, which, as is always the way with EL panels, burns out over time and stops working. Hmm, well, we could probably fix that, or we could just replace the whole screen. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and before we go any farther, a little bit of backstory on this. This was supposed to be a side video alongside the, the main video whenever that happened. And now I've gone back and started doing this in higher quality because that main video is going to be a long, long way away. Uh, first of the machine I was going to look at broke. It's just a keyboard controller, I think. Should be an easy fix. Fairly sure I have a tube of compatible spars and it's an ECS board, so it is socketed. So it should just be as easy as taking the monitor off the top of the machine, opening it and swapping it. But there's not much point. Because if you watch the second channel, you know I've had nothing but problems with capture and it's getting nowhere impossible. I don't want to spend money on it and I've been fighting with it for years and it's just got worse and worse. And at this moment in time, I just give up. I give up and anyway, I think people are done with DOS PCs. Everyone's moving away from it. It seems nearly dead. I'm not going to abandon it. I'm not leaving it. But for now, can't do much with it. So <laughs> we'll do this instead. I was going to, you know, obviously as these were meant to be side things, I was going to start branching into more general electronics anyway. So I guess we're just having to do that a little bit more farmly than we would have done, but in any case, you know what we're here for, uh, screen replacement. Because one of the most important things about using a, a synthesizer is being able to use it. And on the top of the stand here there's the Profit, I still need to do a synth demo. I've got a big backlog of, mu backlog of music, I I'll get there, it's just time is... Now I don't have to worry about capturing shit, maybe I'll have more fucking free time. But yeah, this thing's easy to use. There's a bunch of knobs, there's LEDs on the buttons to tell you which button's on and off, because they're only momentary switches, and a seven-segment LED display to tell you which program's selected, but a lot of the time you'll use it out of preset mode, and it's one of the big things with synthesizers, just playing with them and seeing what sort of interesting noises you can make come out. Uh, and sometimes that inspires you, like, I can make a thing with that, or that'll fit in that thing I've already made when I didn't know what sound to put there, and then you dig it out again. But, yeah, below that, CZ5000. It's a different, like, thing to use. It's a lot easier than a DX7, because that's a piece of fucking shit. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, LEDs above the buttons, uh, LCD display, not backlit, never was, but it gets the light from my ceiling and from the window, so that's not too bad, you know, and with both things you sort of end up being able to operate them somewhat by feel, anyway, after a while. Another bottom's my best synth, the Casio CZ1, someone's getting it annoyed just saying it's better than the Prophet 5, which I am, but only in the context that sometimes you want a hammer, and sometimes you want a multi-piece tap and die set. They're very different tools for very different jobs. You probably could use them interchangeably, but you won't get the same results. In any case, it's on the bottom of the stand. So the LEDs I can see, the screen I can't, because the backlight's burnt out. So we're going to have to fix that. And, uh, well, that's what we're going to be doing today. I will be discussing how to do it cheaply and effectively, not get ripped off, and, uh, yeah, just solve the problem. There's numerous ways you can do this, and we're going to look at probably the best option and what is quite possibly among the silliest options. Uh, yeah, we'll just fucking get on with it. <laughs> I'm done standing here talking, I'm knackered actually. Well, obviously one very simple solution would be to just replace the EL tape with a new piece. should be available in just about any colour you can think of, though the default, and therefore brightest, will always be a rather pretty neon blue. This will get you the most authentic look, but it will also burn out again, likely within about a decade if you use the synthesizer a lot. Alternatively, we could try to find an LED backlight that would fit in place of the tape and never have to deal with the EL panels again. Unfortunately, I've not found anywhere that sells them separately. Another possibility is to replace the entire screen module with a different one. There's a few options for replacing the screen, and it's probably the easiest way to do it in this day and age. 
certainly one of those options is to get ripped off by a replacement kit. If you bought one of these, then I have no sympathy for you, and I won't apologise for calling you an idiot. But everybody makes mistakes, and maybe you might have learned from it now. I guess the cost must be for the cable it comes with. It's not even the right type of cable. If you'd used some logic and done even the smallest bit of research, you'd find a few clues on the original module as to what that replacement is. Let us remember that this is a Casio synthesizer, which came in at a much lower price point than most of its contemporaries, and likely lower than anything with similar capabilities at the time. There has to be some way they achieved this, and one such thing is probably skimping on R&D money where it didn't need to be spent in the first place. Why develop a brand new display technology when you can just buy a fairly mature one from Hitachi for not a lot of money that does everything you want it to? Indeed, the original display is a Hitachi LM016, but most importantly, the thing we're looking at is the chip on the back, which is the Hitachi HD44780. Yeah, it's a HD display. No, but the IC is something of a standard for LCD displays, namely dot character displays, and, well, that's what this is. It's a 16 by 2 dot character LCD display. Each character is in a 5x8 block of dots, or I think it's 5x8, I can't actually remember. As it happens, displays like this turn up bloody everywhere. All Casio CZ instruments and the RZ1 drum machine use the same display or some variant of it. I'm fairly sure the Akai S2000 uses one, but it might be a Toshiba in there. Washing machines, boilers and Arduinos actually use them. There are a few discrepancies. Initially, the displays only did parallel, largely 4-bit Intel 8080 and an 8-bit Motorola 6800 mode. The Casio is a Japanese machine through and through, so it seems quite fitting that it uses the latter of these. So widespread is the standard for these displays that they're still made, and I could even buy one locally for $2.99. The price went up just slightly since I did that. If you get one of these, they're usually all the same pinout. Just wire it to the original cable and it's good to go. You don't have to do anything. If you want to use a new cable, you could mush a DuPont onto the original connector. But, again, there's not really anything wrong with just desoldering the original cable and putting it on your new display. Maybe add a resistor in series with the LCD backlight, though, because it's quite bright and the contrast isn't very good on these displays. They're very cheap, we can't expect a lot from them. Still, the backlight is the only difference in the pinout. It just has two extra pins for it. Obviously, check yours before you wire it. There's so many of these from so many different manufacturers, there probably is one that does it differently. And some of them have jumpers that need to be set to... You know, put them in the right mode uh, to work with this. And uh, some are set to serial by default now because I think that's more common today. This type of screen, though, is the cheap and sensible option. It is the option I would recommend. It will solve the problem and probably solve it pretty much permanently. Its response time is very poor, as is the contrast, and the backlight colour is a little bit pukey. But it costs so little that you can't really complain, and as it's a musical instrument, you don't really care very much about molasses response times and good quality. As long as you can read it, that's all that really needs to happen. When you've operated these things enough, you don't really look at the screen that much. You can do a lot of it by feel, so you just glance at it occasionally to make sure things are where you think they are. If the quality does bother you, then obviously just buy a better quality one, or hey, you might even be able to just steal a compatible display from some dead device somewhere completely free. I mean, there's no shortage of them in the world. To install any display in this, uh, obviously we do need to open the instrument. I, I don't think I need to say, just because my audience is probably a far bit smarter than the average person, that, well, there are mains voltages in this machine, and if you don't unplug it from the wall, you could die. To open the instrument, there's these five screws on the back, but not that one. That one holds a ground wire on. If you do turn it and you hear the nut fall off, it doesn't really matter. I suppose it's no big deal as we're going in the instrument anyway, so you can just put it back on. Be wary that there is a star washer on it, though, and if that's disappeared, then you better get in there and fish it out wherever it's got to, because you don't want to short something out. The top of the instrument has four screws, and then you can lift it. Just tilt it back, rest it on the, the back of the, the machine there. It hasn't got hinges like on some really fancy wank synths, but you can work in there quite easily and mine conveniently just rests there when it's on the keyboard stand. It's pretty nice. 
Inside we can't actually see the two 15 MHz NEC 7810 CPUs without removing the keybed and I'd prefer not to take that off just because it's quite a hassle and I don't need to get in there right now. If you need to replace the RAM battery you will have to take it off though as it is underneath there. Hey look, a thing you won't see in a DX7, a voltage selector switch. Cool. Also, there's that relay that makes your outputs quiet when the contacts in it go dirty. You can just pop that plastic cover off quite easily and clean it if you want, and it'll clip back on when you're done. What we want, though, is this wire going to the LCD display. The display is in a metal bracket that needs to be removed. Curiously, it is driven by eight assignable I.O. pins on the primary CPU, which is shared with the cartridge port on the CZ1. I'm not sure why this might be useful or hindering, but I figured I should probably just tell you in case that ever crops up. Newer displays might have differently sized PCBs and thicknesses, so you might have to modify them or make something for them to get them to fit the instrument properly. Regardless, it's not really a very hard job to do. As you're not using the EL driver anymore, it's probably worth taking this board off and cutting the little wire links to the flip-flop base supply. This will take some stress off the power transistor. The power supply in this instrument is linear. It uses Zener diodes to get a reference for a power transistor. It's not a very efficient setup, but it's a very old and simple setup that's tried and tested and it generally just works and there's minimal fuss and doesn't make noise. To which end disconnecting the EL driver will probably remove a little bit of noise from the, the system, even if it is getting filtered out quite effectively. You've now got less risk of it, because now you don't have this flip-flop running at a million miles an hour. Anyways, we know how to take the original display out and put one of these modern LCDs or alleged uh, LED displays in there. But that's a bit boring, and now we can just be silly, as there is another option, and one I really don't recommend. It predates LCD displays, and there's more of the EVL panels in the 1950s, so... Well, it doesn't seem really out of place in this instrument. It's not like it came later, and it was still in fairly common use by the mid-80s. It has excellent contrast, brightness, and response times. It's a vacuum fluorescent display. You might have seen these in clocks and VCRs, cars, old laser printers. Yeah, not that uncommon at all at one time. As it happens, there's a class of VFDs called LCD emulators, and... Well, what do you know? They emulate the Hitachi HD 44780. They also run on 5 volts. This means we should be able to use one in the Casio CZ, but there are a few things that we need to consider before we start doing this. Firstly, the display needs a relatively high voltage, which it generates on board, and, well, this might introduce electrical noise. I don't need to explain why having electrical noise is a bad idea in an electronic musical instrument, but... It's a risk that you run. Another thing which applies to any display, really, is that we are playing about with pins that are connected directly to the CPU. If you fuck something up, then you could just blow the CPU up and kill the instrument. And as far as I know, the CPU actually contains some ROM, and, well, yeah, I don't think you could just directly replace it. You would need one out of another CZ1. Plus the fact the 15 MHz version doesn't really seem anywhere near as common as the slower ones. I don't think it'd be that easy to find. Of course, fucking something up like that is a risk with an LCD display, but with the VFD having relatively high voltages on board, about 50 volts, it probably makes it a bit more of a possibility, especially with its more dense component count as, well, it needs more parts on board to make it work. Lastly, and probably most importantly, VFD displays use far more power than an LCD. Our LCDs use a few microamps, and the LED backlight probably uses about 20 milliamps. This doesn't add much load to the power supply, which is good for about 3 amps at a stretch, and it's on the digital supply rail, so that has to run all of the logic in the synthesizer and the EL driver when that was connected. The VFD uses 200 milliamps, a whole watt. Due to how the power supply works, this means you're going to be dissipating a couple more watts as heat through the D313 power transistor that drives this rail. And if it can't take this over a long period of time, it'll burn up and it might fail short circuits. 
And if that happens, you're going to end up feeding unregulated voltage, about 15 volts, into the instrument's digital supply rail. I really don't need to explain why this is a particularly bad thing when it's going to be at least three times the intended voltage for the electronics in that circuit. There is something to be said that a Zener diode would probably just start conducting massively and a fuse would blow, but that's going to take a little while if it happens at all. And so I just don't really recommend taking this chance if you're at all worried about breaking the instrument. Me personally, I think I could fix it. Our display is a Futaba M16 2SD54AA. You might notice the lack of clone Hitachi IC, and really no ICs at all on the, so to speak of anyway, nothing that really stands out. This is because all the logic is actually contained within the glass itself. It's chip on glass technology, that's pretty clever. The board isn't as wide as the original LCD, and the display is also slightly smaller. Though you can get them in just about any size you want. The pinout is the same, so wiring's rather easy. The metal bracket has to be bent a little, but it will fit, and away we go. That was not really hard at all, it's just pretty much the same as installing an LCD. Oh, but it is so much prettier, isn't it? Look at that blue-green hue, and it looks even nicer in real life. You don't get that streak that you get on the camera, which is weird, because I have astigmatism, and I usually see streaks from light that other things don't. It might look really nice with a polarizing glass to turn it yellow or something, but well, I think the blue fits the aesthetic of the instrument. The contrast is absolutely fantastic under most lighting levels. The dots are nice and sharp and uniform, and the response time... It is so fast, the busy flag never comes on on this display. The display can update probably faster than the CPU in this thing is ever going to be driving it, and it might even make some functions faster on the instrument, as the CPU will never have to wait for the display to finish what it's doing. It doesn't feel out of place, as VFDs were already rather mature and widely used by the time the instrument was made. They are a 50s invention. Only those older ones use significantly more power than our one here. It's actually quite efficient, all things considered. Indeed, I have to wonder if Casio might have even considered using one, but opted not to, as they would have needed to have a far beefier power supply to generate the voltages needed, and would also likely have had to include a lot of additional logic as I'm not really sure this LCD emulator type existed back then. If it did, it was probably quite expensive. Certainly today, they can cost ten times what a cheap LCD display would, between twenty and thirty pounds for the model I have, but it's a damn sight partier, and it is a damn sight cheaper than those scammer replacement kits. Also, while they won't likely run into this aspect in a CZ1, VFDs like this tend to come with a more complete character set than the LCDs. They're usually missing about half of them. The instrument doesn't really use the extended characters, so you'll probably never actually notice this unless you've been very particular with sending names up the MIDI cables. So, but it, yeah, it, it's just something to think about. Because, I mean, you might want to do this on something that does use those characters and just never thought to do it before. So there you go. Provided it has the same line and column count, you can do this to most any device using this type of display, so long as you can provide enough power to run it without blowing something up. I can't recommend doing this modification to the CZ1, as there is every chance it, it will just kill the power transistor and destroy the instrument, but the temperatures look correct, and I do doubt the original, now disconnected EL driver was really ever all that efficient itself, so it might be breaking even. And if you're confident in your soldering and wiring abilities, then that may be the fail-safe option. By all means, go for it. But in any case, I guess I'll hand you off to the knobhead who stands around in front of the camera. And, well, it was a fun little tangent, wasn't it? I thought so, anyway. So there we go. It was actually quite easy, wasn't it? Not very difficult at all. And uh, I don't recommend doing what I've done. Uh, you know, it's relatively inexpensive, but it might get expensive if we blow the instrument up, so you just get a cheap LCD. Uh, but yeah, if you're willing to build your own power supply and stuff, I guess there's no real ends to what you could apply this to. I mean, you could put one in a DX7. Uh, I think it uses the same standard. 
just has more columns on it. I think you can have up to, was it 40 or was it 80? I don't know, I'd have to look in the data sheet again. You can have bigger ones, you just drive it as multiple screens. So, yeah, in theory, anything that talks that protocol, you could do this with. And, yeah, it's pretty neat. And I've never seen anyone else put a VFD in one, and I think it looks a lot better than the LCD. Uh, you know, people say about OLED, I've never actually seen a, a no LED display in one. Uh, none of the, the kits they sell at their inflated price, they're all LCDs. I, I have seen somebody just pick up a generic LED display, and that, that may actually, that should be viable, I guess, because you can buy those, I can't remember, they're more expensive than LCDs is about all I know, but, uh, yeah, that's really it. <laughs> um, I don't know, well, what will we do next, because, as I say, capturing, not, not on the cards right now, uh, the only way I can do it is not usable for making videos here, really. So I don't know, we'll, uh, I've got that June Newcomb video that's long overdue, I could do that, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> I've got some electronics projects I've done, I could do videos on them. I could do more general hardware where I don't have to capture the screen necessarily. So yeah, there's still things we can do, but it's just taken me a while to adapt and hopefully eventually I'll get past the, oh, you fucking as long to have. I'm just at my wit's end, so I'm not willing to, to play with it anymore at the moment, the capture problem, but I will, eventually. I just need time away from it. And I think anyone who's worked with stuff like this has, has been in that situation with something, so I'm sure you understand, and if you don't and you're angry about it or something, then, well, I don't fucking owe you anything, so <laughs> I'm sorry you were under that delusion. And uh, I'm not some, you know, big sellout partner channel, so I, I can't stand here and beg for money and I wouldn't anyway and I don't make nothing on this so you know I, I, I make my money on real things so yeah and I don't want to spend any on fixing this problem at all I'll I'll find some way around it but I'm not that bothered uh, and yeah that, that's it we replaced the screen like we said we would and as I say this applies to more than just the CZ one it, it should apply to any device that uses that type of screen there are other standards out there. The Corgo one uses, uh, was it a Toshiba standard? Uh, that's different. And you can do like graphics with it. And I've replaced screen in that. That is crap, that screen. But it, it's good enough for me to be. I, I, maybe I can actually start using that thing a bit more because it's really powerful, the Corgo one. Can't find one for the Akai so far. So if I ever track down a compatible one, I'll probably make a video on it just to fuck over all the uh, scam houses that are out there and uh, that could be quite fun but as yet, like I said, I haven't found one for that and there's a lot of that mislabeled out there, you've got to really watch out for that because the manufacturers themselves will mislabel these things quite a lot so you've really got to be quite thorough and a lot of the time just make sure you've got a returns policy on what you're buying because you might not get what you think you're getting, it'll be the wrong size, the wrong type and it's pretty annoying but it, it does happen on especially the less common types like that. Anyways, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching. And I will see you again somewhere down the line, I'm sure. Oh, for fuck's sake. Uh, yeah, it's, uh... Yeah. This this will be more... Well, this has been more fun to work on. So I'm actually... I'm actually glad I had this lined up. Like, you know? Uh, yeah. I sort of feel a bit better now, to be honest. Right, anyways... Uh, I can't do the DOS thing, uh, don't be a, I can't say that word, uh, <laughs> well anyways, yeah, load the uh, 7810 SMP capable assembly code up, it's, it's not as catchy is it, dear, I'm going away now, I've made an idiot of myself.